Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. All right. It's good to see all of you out this evening. Tonight we're going to start Daniel 9. And this is quite honestly such an extraordinary chapter in biblical prophecy. This is... Mm, this, this chapter, you can see I'm into it a little bit. This chapter not only tells us the most important prophecy in all of the Old Testament, the exact time that Messiah will be present in the world, but it also begins with a prayer, and this prayer is by Daniel, that many have said is filled with more pure devotion and spiritual content than any other portion in the whole of Scripture. That's an opinion, and I think I tend to agree with it. This is a really exciting bunch of Scripture to look at. So we're going to be spending some time on that prayer, and the reason is I'm convinced that this should be the prayer that every Messianic synagogue on the face of this earth is saying simply because we are now involved in the third and final restoration of the nation of Israel. And Daniel's praying this as we're looking towards the first restoration. He's praying this prayer that his city and that his people will be restored. And the chapter begins with Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 years of the desolation of Jerusalem being mentioned by Daniel. Then it's the intercessory prayer by Daniel. Then at the end of the chapter, which concludes with the third vision that's involving the angel Gabriel, a vision that provides us with one of the most important keys to understanding the scriptures as a whole, I believe. And that last piece is only four verses. And we're going to spend half of the time that we spend in chapter 9 just on those four verses. Next week I'm going to give you an hour just on those four verses. This ninth chapter specifically takes up prophecy as it applies to God's chosen people, Israel, only. So then let's start with Daniel 9 and verses 1 and 2. It says, In the first year of Davarish, the son of Ahashkavarash, a Mede by birth, who was made king over the kingdom of the Kazdim, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, was reading the scriptures and thinking about the number of years which Adonai had told Jeremiah the prophet would be the period of Jerusalem's desolation. Seventy years. Lock seventy into your minds. Seventy is important. What are we just beginning to look at tomorrow? The 70th anniversary of Israel. If we wade through Scripture, we find God doing huge things that are connected to this 70 in days, years, months, hours, maybe. I don't know. It's interesting. This talking about, as it opens the chapter up here, would be Darius, the son of Xerxes, in, in the Kazdim would be mentioned with the Babylonian Empire in most English translations. Now, since we finished chapter 8 last week, we've had about 13 years 
passage of time as we begin to move through this uh, chapter 9. Chapter 8 was of a vision given to Daniel in 551 B.C. The time is now 538 B.C. and a couple of things have happened in the interim. Number one, the Babylonian Empire has fallen. We looked at that. We looked at that. It happened in chapter 5 of Daniel with the handwriting on the wall and the night that Babylon fell. And number two is the next thing that happened after that concerning Daniel in chapter 6 that we looked at is Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel in the lion's den. It's believed that this prophecy was given in that year that Daniel went into the lion's den. It's also believed that the vision occurred shortly after Daniel was delivered from the lions. And the reason for that is because of Daniel's experiences that line up just before this happens. There's the handwriting on the wall. There's the deliverance from the lion's den. And these were significant evidences of God's sovereignty and power. In fact, perhaps we could look at them as divine preparation for Daniel for the revelation of what's about to unfold or unfold in this chapter. Now the opening verses, the opening verses tell us that Daniel was reading from Jeremiah the prophet. And I got to make you think about this just a little bit. Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel. Daniel's in Babylon. Jeremiah got thrown off in the other direction. After the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, Nebuchadnezzar appointed Jewish leaders to control the area of Judah. Uh, that was after he took, uh, took it the first time. Sort of a puppet regime, if you will, in place there. But the Jewish, there was a Jewish contingent that came along and rebelled against this regime and murdered the leader. Jeremiah was captured by these rebellious Jews and against his will was taken to Egypt. He's in Egypt. He's a contemporary of Daniel who's reading what he wrote, but Daniel's in Babylon. In those days, it wasn't an hour's flight from one place to another. It took you months to make that trip. And according to tradition, Jeremiah was put to death by stoning. He was buried in a strange land in a nameless grave, yet his writings made it to Babylon this quickly, and Daniel's reading them. Fascinating stuff. By the way, it's interesting if you want to do this, you can go to Hebrews 11.37. That whole chapter is a listing of those people who trusted God and put their faith in Him. And in that, that verse, Hebrews 11.37, there's a reference to someone being sawed in two. Everybody picks up on that one. He was sawed in two. Oh. But the one just before that who was stoned to death is again by tradition thought to be Jeremiah. Now, on to Jeremiah's prophecy. Jeremiah 25, 11. This entire land is speaking of Israel now because everything from this point on has to do only with Israel. This entire land will become a ruin, a waste. Those nations who served the king of Babel, Babylon for 70 years, there are 70 again, but when the 70 years are over, I, this is God speaking, will punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their sins, says Adonai, and I will turn the land of the Kazdim into everlasting ruins. Ooh, well. This prophecy, by the way, is at least partially complete. The ancient city of Babylon, where it was located, currently is in a barren wasteland. Now, Saddam Hussein, <laughs> I was calling him Saddam Insane last time I gave this message. Saddam Hussein, dictator of Iraq, attempted to restore the ancient city of Babylon, but had only marginal success. He got swept out for he got complete. A bit later on in Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, there's also talk about Babylon, but this is is not speaking of the same time that we're referring to here in this passage in Jeremiah 25. It's, it's talking about in, in chapters 50 and 51, a time that is concerning Israel and the whole land of 
that's occupied there now being made desolate again really laid to waste. This is a type and foreshadow that we're looking at of what's going to be talked about in Daniel in uh, Jeremiah 50. I think that Jeremiah 50 is talking about the Babylon of Revelation, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and all of that. Jeremiah prophesied, he also prophesied about what's here in Jeremiah 25, uh, the 70 years desolation in chapter 29, if you would please. Chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. Here's what Adonai says, After Babylon's 70 years are over, I will remember you and fulfill my good promise to you by bringing you back to this place, back into the land. He's going to restore Israel. For I know what plans I have in mind for you, says Adonai, plans for well-being, not for bad things, so that you can have hope and a future. When you call to me and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you seek me, you will find me, provided you seek for me wholeheartedly, and I will let you find me, says Adonai. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. He's going to gather us. He's going to make us find him. Let us find him. Reach out and grab us and hug us. Okay, I got off on a tangent. <laughs> then I will reverse your exile. I will gather you from all the nations and the places where I've driven you, says Ed and I, and I will bring you back to the place from which I exiled you. That's kind of expansion on what we just looked at back in chapter 25. I think there's got to be really little doubt that these are scriptures, the scriptures that Daniel is referring to as he's speaking to us in chapter 9, verse 2 that we've looked at. So Daniel knew then that the time was approaching when God was going to return Judah, the Jews, to the land. Now this speaks only of Judah. Speaks only of Judah, the northern kingdom, the rest of Israel gets no mention of return until the end of days. Now I want you to watch this real close because here is the peg that nails this prophecy to completion. The first group was taken captive to Babylon in 606 BC. The return to the land was in 636 BC, a period of exactly 70 years. It's also interesting that the temple was destroyed in 586, its rebuilding was completed and the rededication occurred in 516, also an exact period of 70 years. So there's 70 years as prophesied for that to have taken place, two periods, one concerning the duration of the people's exile, one concerning the duration of the temple being in ruins. More evidence, I believe, of the orderliness of our God. It's also interesting to note that once the people were back in the land, there was so much hindrance in their being able to rebuild the temple. People had kept pushing against it from various areas. A perverse opposition, you might say, to the temple being rebuilt, and that caused delay stretching this out to the full 70 years of desolation. Now there's some things that we need to take note of here. Number one is that even though Daniel was acquainted with the symbolic form of revelation used by Jeremiah, his interpretation of Jeremiah was literal. Even though there's a lot of poetic form going on in Jeremiah's writings, Daniel took everything literally. He took the 70 years literally and felt that the 70 years exile that would be then literally fulfilled, and he was right. He was right. Number two, Daniel realized that the word of God would only be fulfilled on a basis of prayer. He realized that the word of God would only be fulfilled on a basis of prayer. On one hand, Daniel recognized the sovereignty of God and, and the servant certainty of divine purpose, that God would surely fulfill his word. But on the other hand, Daniel recognized uh, 
that human agency was also required in this. It was requiring the participation of people. There's a current requirement of people involved in the return of Yeshua as Messiah, stated for us in Scripture. We'll close with that. This human agency requirement was a necessity for faith and for prayer. How the human responsibility is really to respond to the divine program that God has laid out is, is critically important. We could take the attitude that there's no need to pray, there's no use to pray really, because whatever's going to happen is going to be, you know, it's going to be, in fact, however, we have to understand man has a place in God's divine programs. Which is why Daniel is praying this huge prayer in this chapter 9. And we're going to run through it pretty quickly, so you're going to need to review this probably on two or three occasions to really set it into your minds. But anyhow, Daniel is praying here, and the fact that he is praying here is showing that there he needs to be involved in God's greater program. And as an example of us being needed in God's greater program, let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 8. One time when Zechariah, this is John the Baptist's father, was fulfilling his duties as Cohen priest during his division's period of service before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priests, to enter the temple and burn incense. Now, all the people were outside praying at the time of the incense burning. Hold there for a second, please. The people were outside praying as he was burning incense, but he wasn't just in there throwing some stuff on the fire. Predictions of God that were repeated twice a day, every day in the temple, three days on Shabbat. And there were people outside praying that these things, and they were begging God to fulfill things. And there's a specific thing in there that is a tripwire that him being in there sets off. Next when there appeared to him, that Zechariah, while he's in there praying, and the people are outside praying, an angel of Adonai standing to the right of the incense altar. And Zechariah was startled and terrified at the sight, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Now, wait a minute. There's people outside praying. He's in there doing these 16 benedictions. They've been done by everybody and his dog that's a Cohen, that's a priest that week, and yet he's heard. That one individual was terribly important to that. And that is the picture we need to take out of this, that one individual praying for a specific thing that God has ordained to happen can be the tripwire, can be the thing that causes it to happen. That's what happened here. Don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elisheva, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you're to name him Yochanan, John. Hmm. Your prayer has been heard. That's the reason that Gabriel, that's who the angel turns out to be when you read further. That's the reason Gabriel is there. Zechariah has been praying for something in God's program. And those 16 benediction had been heard and it was about to be granted. He was about to be blessed with a son who would announce Messiah Yeshua to Messiah Yeshua's people as the start of Yeshua's first earthly ministry. Daniel understood all this that's going on, understood this relationship that man has in God's divine program. Again, this is why Daniel is praying here. Now, moving back to Daniel 9, verses 3 and 4, please. I, this is Daniel, turned to Adonai, God, to seek an answer, pleading with him in prayer, with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to Adonai, my God, and made this confessional. Please, Adonai, great and fearsome God, who keeps his covenant and who extends grace to those who love him and observe his mitzvos, his instructions. Daniel begins his prayer with a confession. With a confession. As we'll see, this confession of Daniel is not dealing with personal sin. It's dealing with the sins of the nation, Israel and with Daniel's identification to that sin. 
What we must understand is that from Daniel's point of view, the sins of Israel, the sins, the nation's sins were actually corporate sins, and by that means they became also his sins, even though he wasn't directly involved. And so he had to pray for those sins. He had to ask for forgiveness for those sins. And that's why I think this prayer is so important. We need to develop that same attitude that Daniel had about the things that are going on with Israel and Israel's failure to be walking with their God. It is important to all who are believers in all of the Messianic synagogues all over the world, all the churches that will come aboard with this, to approach prayer with that identity with Israel and that being that God wants to restore Israel, it is part of his plan. Until the restoration of Israel is complete in multiple ways, there is going to be no return of Messiah Yeshua. We must be in prayer for the nation Israel for the corporate sin of Israel to be forgiven. And Daniel is our type and foreshadow in what he's praying here. Daniel 9, 5 through 14, and we're going to just basically run through what he's praying here. We have sinned, corporate prayer, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your mitzvot and rulings. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, our ancestors, and to all the people in the land. Everybody gets lumped in here. From the king to the grunt. To you, Adonai, belongs righteousness, but to us today belongs shame. To us, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, including those nearby and those far away. Because remember, the upper kingdom's already gone. They're far away. Throughout all the countries where you have driven them, because they broke faith with you. Next. Yes, Adonai, shame falls on us, our kings, our leaders, and our ancestors, because we sinned against you. It is for Adonai, our God, to show compassion and forgiveness because we rebelled against him. We didn't listen to the voice of Adonai, our God, so that we could live by his laws. We ignored God. Hmm. So that we, which he presented to us through his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel flouted your Torah and turned away, unwilling to listen to your voice. Therefore, the curse and oath written in the Torah of Moses, the servant of God, is poured out on us because we sinned against him. He carried out the threats he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us disaster so great that under heaven nothing has been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Never has this happened before. Wow. As written in the Torah of Moses, this whole disaster came upon us. Yet, and pay attention to that because we're going to look at that, what's written in the Torah of Moses. Yet we did not appease Adonai, our God, by renouncing our wrongdoing and discerning your truth. In other words, this is all going on and nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's turning back to God. So Adonai watched for the right moment to bring this disaster upon us. For Adonai, our God, was just in everything that he did. Yet we didn't listen when he spoke. Talk about your confessions, huh? Daniel appreciates the collective responsibility that he shares with the nation Israel, both in promises of blessing and in warnings of divine judgment. He doesn't try to cover up or explain away or justify any of the actions of Israel. Again, what a confession Daniel makes here. The extent of the sins of the nation are fourfold. One, we have committed sins, serious crimes or offenses. Two, we have committed iniquity, acted unjustly. Three, we have acted wickedly, rebelled from, by departing from God's precepts. Four, then the disregard for the prophets that God sent is slam dunked here. Also here, the disobedience and disrespect that's going on of God is laid completely at the feet of all repeat, all of Israel's society, from the kings all the way down to the peasants. It's directed at the kings and to the others in the leadership and to all the people in the land. Gives us an example of Israel's condition that they have gone into multiple times, like over and over and over. 
For example, during the reign of King Hezekiah, Hezekiah was in revival. He was in revival and messengers were sent throughout the land to remind the people that they were to come up to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now, if you're not familiar with this, Passover is listed as a pilgrimage feast in which God requires all of Israel to present themselves before him at the temple in Jerusalem. I don't care where you're at. If you're in San Francisco, get on a plane and present yourself there. The only thing that saves us right now is there's no temple. The people had to be reminded that this was a pilgrimage feast gotten completely away from them. That was their condition before God. This was the problem that was in the land. Everything that God is really truly requiring is kind of obscure. And it's not that much different today in the land of Israel. Let's look at Hezekiah's message for just a minute since he's mentioned here. Second Chronicles 30, 6 and 7. So runners went with the letters from the king and his officers throughout all Israel and Judah. They conveyed the king's order. People of Israel, turn back to Adonai, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then he will return to you, those of you who remain, who escaped capture by the kings of Asher, that's Assyria. Don't be like your ancestors or like your kinsmen who have sinned against Adonai, the God of their ancestors with the result that he allowed them to become an object of horror, as you see. This is going ahead to verse 10. So the runners passed from city to city through the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, two of the sons of Jacob, as far as Zebulon, but the people laughed at them and made fun of them. He sent messengers Get your act together, and the people said, <laughs> we don't have to do this. This was about 150 years prior to the prayer of Daniel that we're looking at, 80 years or so before the Babylonian exile began. So we can see from this what Daniel was talking about in his prayer, that even the common people of the land were being disobedient and disrespectful. In verses 7 and 8 of that prayer of Daniel, Daniel contrasts the righteousness of God and the shame that belongs to all of Israel. On Israel, and Israel's shame has made them the object of scorn among the nations, which is what they've earned from their rebellion against God. The scathing that all the countries of their exile has given Israel is not because of one sin. We're talking about what's happened in the last 2,000 years. It's because, not of one sin, but because God has had it after generation, after generation, after generation, who have consistently come back to the same point of failure to obey God's instructions or pay heed to the prophets. That's the case right now Today in Israel, 80% of Israel in the land is claiming to be secular. Among those of us in the Galut, the diaspora living outside of Israel, it's about the same. It's about the same. Even among those that consider themselves religious, very few are truly obedient to Torah or to the heeding of prophets. They're just being religious. Just being religious. It's much easier just to be religious than to be obedient and respectful of God. I can be really religious and go out and hammer what God tells me to be doing into the ground. But I can be religious about it. In verse 8, we're not going to go back there, but in verse 8 it was itemized that those ashamed were our kings, our leaders, our ancestors, and God didn't spare any class from responsibility. Verse 9 is a contrast. It's of the mercies and the forgiveness of God. This is in the plural in the Hebrew, showing that this mercy and forgiveness is extended and continual. Do you, you grasp that? It's done in the plural, which is an indication in the Hebrew that this mercy and forgiveness is extended and continual. 
Hashem, the name, is a God of righteousness, but also a God of mercy. And it was on this ground that Daniel is basing his petition that the fact that our God is a God of righteousness and a God of mercy. Note that Daniel also changes here from the second person. He's been, as you go back and read this chapter, you'll notice he's been saying, you, Adonai, are righteous in verse 7. But then all of a sudden, and later on, he's in the third person, Adonai, our God. Adonai, our God. That change stating that the truth that he is speaking is for all to hear. Our God. Our God. He's talking, Daniel is, about the fact that we, Israel, have not walked according to the Torah, the instructions, or what is proclaimed to us by God's prophet. All of Israel has transgressed, and God has applied the curse prophesied by Moses. This prophecy was laid out by Moses at least 800 years earlier. Let's look at it. Deuteronomy 28, please. Thus it will come about that just as once Adonai took joy in seeking to do you good and increase your numbers, so now Adonai will take joy in causing you to perish and be destroyed, and you will be plucked off the land you are entering in in order to take possession of it. Adonai will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. He's done it. And there you will serve other gods made of wood and stone, which neither you nor ancestors have known. We've done it. Among these nations you will not find repose and there will be no rest for the sole of your foot. Rather, Adonai will give you their anguish of heart, dimness of eyes, and apathy of spirit. Your life will hang in doubt before you. You will be afraid night and day and you have no assurance that you will stay alive. Have you ever read any things that went on during the Dark Ages, during the Middle Ages against Israel, the pogroms that would suddenly come against Israel? That's prophesied right there by Moses. In the morning you will say, Oh, how I wish it were evening. In the evening you will say, Oh, how I wish it were morning because of the fear overwhelming your heart and the sights that your eyes will see. <laughs> if you think about this, these things are the punishment that's come about for Israel, the northern kingdom, as dispersed, and Judah, the southern kingdom, as dispersed. This is the curse that Daniel was talking about in verses 13 and 14. Daniel itemizes the evil which God has allowed to come upon them because of their sin. Great disaster. Great disaster. Under the whole of heavens, nothing has been done like that that is being done to Jerusalem at that point of Daniel's existence. And while all this is going on with Daniel, nothing is being done to seek the favor of God. Yeah, they're doing all these things that causes God to be really teeth grinding and tossing them out. Yet they're not doing anything to curry his favor by turning from their sins and giving attention to what he wants them to do. Giving attention to his truths, if you will. This is going to happen again. This is happening again. We're in the process of living through it. But this time it's even going to get worse because it's not going to involve just some areas in the Middle East. It's going to ultimately involve the whole world. Man doesn't learn much from his history. Let's go to Revelation 16, verse 10, please. This is what's forecast or prophesied to happen during the end of the age. And it says the fifth one, this is the fifth one of the angels that comes down uh, with, the, with the bowls. And the fifth one poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, the beast being the false messiah. And its kingdom grew dark, and the people gnawed their tongues from pain. Yet they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores and did not turn from their sinful deeds. In other words, God's going to level stuff on them because of what they've been doing, and they're not going to even begin to turn back to him to stop it. They're going to curse him because he's doing it, even though it's their fault. 
What Daniel is saying is that God's had no other choice in, in this. Even though he's a God of mercy, when mercy is rejected and trampled on, the option left to him then is judgment. Judgment must come because God has promised it. He has promised it. And in the end, though, because of that judgment, ultimately righteousness wins. Now in Daniel 9... Verses 15 through 19, we're going to look at the last part of the prayer. And this is a petition for forgiveness and restoration. So give me Daniel 9, 15, please. Now Adonai, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand, thereby winning renown for yourself, as is the case today, we sinned. We acted wickedly. Adonai, in keeping with all your justice, Please allow your anger and your fury to be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because it is due to our sins and the wrongdoings of our ancestors that Jerusalem and your people have become objects of scorn among everyone around us. Therefore, our God, listen to the prayer and pleadings of your servant. Cause your face to shine on your desolated sanctuary for your own sake. My God, Turn your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see how desolated we are, as well as the city which bears your name. For we plead with you not because of our own righteousness, but because of your compassion. Adonai hear, Adonai forgive, Adonai pay attention and don't delay action. For your own sake, my God, because your city and your people bear your name. What a petition. What a petition. Think of this for a minute in modern times. This is talking about Daniel's times. Think about this in modern times because this is just a type and foreshadow. In modern times, the city of Jerusalem stands in place today. But what stands on the Temple Mount? what stands on the Temple Mount because of what man has done so he can have peace. What stands on the Temple Mount of Jerusalem is essentially a state of desolation. Think about it. What stands on the Temple Mount today is essentially a state of desolation because desolation applies to the absence of God on that Temple Mount, a spiritual desolation. In the terms of what Daniel is praying here, a spiritual desolation. As of the time <clears throat> that I was preparing these notes, the governments of the United States and the world in general were stating their willingness to give control of the Temple Mount to Islam to allow the spiritual desolation of God's Temple Mount to go on perpetually, perpetually. They were doing this for a false hope of peace. Do you ever read in Scripture when they say, peace, peace, there will be no peace? And more than that, these people that were wanting to put Islam in permanent control were placing their hope not on God, but on what man will do instead of what God would do. There's going to be no peace through this route because the goal of God is that he is going to restore his people to the land and into his presence which will be when he in the form of Yeshua is ruling from that temple in Jerusalem. But history right now that we're living in is in the process of repeating itself. Israel must humble itself and pray for this restoration to take place just as Daniel was. And it looks like that the only ones at the moment that are involved in doing this are going to be the Messianics. The rest of Israel seems to be preoccupied with what man is going to do, what man's doing about the conditions that are in Israel. And frankly, be honest with you, slam dunk me, most of us, the Messianics, act like we don't have a clue. 
We act like we don't have a clue. We think that if we just hang out here that God's going to come and do His thing. Uh Uh-uh. We've got to be like Daniel. We've got to do this thing that Daniel did in the terms that Daniel did it. We've got to be like Daniel is praying here. Now, in this, the burden of Daniel's heart really comes out. And that would be that God would, in keeping with His righteousness and according to His mercies, forgive us and restore His people. And that's what we have to be pursuing. Daniel returns to the prophecy of forgiveness and power of God in delivering the people of Israel from Egypt. In this manifestation of his power, getting a people, Israel, out of Egypt, God gains renown among the nations of the earth. When God took Israel out of Egypt, that was known throughout that whole part of the world, and God gained much renown among the nations around them. They were scared of him. They were scared of Israel because of Israel's God and what Israel's God was doing to all of their gods. This deliverance out of Egypt is really a standard illustration of the power that God can deliver. We see that over and over again in the Bible. That's the standard of God's power in the Old Testament. The standard of God's power in the New Testament, Brit HaDishah, is shown in the raising of Messiah from the dead. Let's go to Ephesians 1, 19, please. And how surprisingly great is his power, that's God, working in us who trust in him. It works with the same mighty strength he used when he worked in the Messiah to raise him from the dead and seat him at his right hand in heaven. Illustration of the power of God that he could do that. He could do that just like he could deliver all of his people from Egypt into the land. Whoa. In the future millennium, in the thousand year reign that's coming, the standard of power will be the regathering of Israel and the restoration of the land and the reigning of Messiah Yeshua. The standard of power. Wow. See, there's been three dispersions and three gatherings in Scripture. First, we were dispersed to Egypt and restored out of Egypt. Next, Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were dispersed by the Babylonian Empire and were restored 70 years later. And then there was a third dispersion of Israel. 70 common era with the destruction of the temple. And we're now living in the era of that final restoration, of that final dispersion of Israel, that last restoration to the land. Daniel states it's the wickedness of Israel that seems to block the way of restoration. Taken 2,000 years. See, the problem is we've sinned. We've done wickedly. That makes Daniel's prayer significant. Here Daniel recognized there is no contradiction between the righteousness of God and His mercies and forgiveness. Scripture has predicted God's judgment. It's also predicted His restoration. A covenant-keeping God will not only inflict judgment, will also bring promised restoration. The appeal here in this prayer is not only will restoration be an act of mercy, an act of mercy, but an act that will bring honor and glory to God, to the God of Israel. Israel is now today in reproach. If we don't think that Israel is in reproach to the nations of the earth right now, just look at how the United Nations consistently votes. Verse 17 turns attention to the restoration of the sanctuary, the place where God met man in the sacrificial system. The whole sacrificial system has fallen into disuse because of the destruction of the temple. This petition is specifically directed towards the temple with its altar of sacrifice and the Holy of Holies. And what's interesting is in this final restoration of the millennial period, We read in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 that there will be another temple built. It's laid out for us there in great detail. 
And it also says there will be a sacrificial system restored there in this new temple to which the prince himself, the Messiah, will attend. What's also interesting is that in Isaiah 66, 18 through 21, it tells us that God is going to make Levites and priests from whom? The Gentiles. You guys is going to get to be Levites and priests in the temple when God returns. If you're being part of his kingdom. They're going to be involved in this. We studied all this in the in studies about the Gerim. In verse 18, Daniel petitions God to lend his ear, to incline his ear, to open his eyes, to behold the desolation that has befallen them and the city that is called by his name. In closing this prayer, Daniel again beseeches God to hear, to forgive, to do, to delay not, all for God's own sake, because God's city, Jerusalem, and God's people, Israel, are called by his name. Scripture is repeating itself, therefore I'm repeating myself, but God, through Daniel and through this chapter, is driving home this point. Now, this prayer has been called one of the most remarkable prayers in the Bible because of this pure devotion and great spiritual content. In it, it is attacked without mercy. It's attacked, think about this, without mercy by those that are called higher critics. Anything of this level of purity and spiritual contact, these critics just can't stand, can't tolerate. And that's the end of the prayer that we're going to look at. But before we go on to the coming of Gabriel, we need to note something. In the case of Daniel here, in the case of Zechariah that we looked at in Luke, and in others, it seems that while prayer is going up, that is ultimately the prayer of one person that is the trigger that sets off what God really wants done. So if you're not praying about something that God's asked you to pray about, you could be the trigger that's keeping it from not going off. Oh, and I got some fingers pointing back at me. When that one individual makes that one particular petition to him, God swings into action. All right, moving on. Daniel 9.20 While I was speaking, praying, confessing my own sin and the sin of my people Israel and pleading before Adonai my God for the holy mountain of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, swooped down on me in full flight at about the time of the evening sacrifice and explained to me, he said, I have come now, Daniel, to enable you to understand this vision clearly. At the beginning of your prayers, an answer was given. Just think about that. At the beginning of his prayers, God acted, and he sent Gabriel all down his way. And I have come to say what it is, because you are greatly loved. Think about that. I have come to say what, you, what it is, because you are greatly loved. Therefore, look into this answer and understand the vision. Gabriel is going to lay it on him. Think about this. While Daniel is in prayer offering this petition, God's answer is already on the way. Implication in verse 20 is that Gabriel was sent at the very beginning of the prayer. And verse 21 tells us that Gabriel touched down about the time of the evening sacrifices. Daniel refers to the angel as the man, Gabriel, and identifies him with the vision back in chapter 8. The term man here, the man, Gabriel, is used in Scripture in the sense of a servant. The name Gabriel is composed of two roots, one of them indicating a strong one, the second indicating a strong God. So the man Gabriel is essentially the strong one of the strong God, the servant, the strong one of the strong God. Now the Hebrew here for the expression where it is stated swoop down on me in full flight seems to indicate that Gabriel is being caused to fly swiftly. It's one of those areas of translation difficulty. This just seems like a good way to say it in English. What it appears to indicate is that although God gave Gabriel the go sign immediately when Daniel began to pray, and although Gabriel flew very swiftly, he did not appear until the end of Daniel's petition. 
No doubt, though, that was because of Adonai's timing. It's interesting, though, as some will tell you, this implies that, and this is just an implication, take it for that, just an implication, that Gabriel was limited by time and space. I don't think so. I think he was limited by when God wanted him to show up. We already know that Satan, on the other hand, can only be at one place and one time on the earth. But I don't think that's the case with God's archangel. God can put him any place he wants, any instant that he wants him. Verse 22, Gabriel talks to Daniel and states the purpose of his coming. Essentially, to give Daniel understanding or insight and understanding. In verse 23, Gabriel confirms what is apply, implied in verse 20. He has been instructed to come to Daniel at the start of Daniel's prayer. Daniel indicates that he was, uh, Gabriel, excuse me, indicates that he was sent to help Daniel to understand the entire matter. All of God's program for Israel. That's the entire matter. All of God's program for Israel, really from that point until Messiah returns and takes up housekeeping in the temple in Jerusalem. And specifically, he's there to explain to Daniel this vision of the 70 weeks. The statement here ends with the fact that Daniel is greatly loved. Some translations say highly esteemed. Let me tell you that the Hebrew literally means precious. The Hebrew literally means precious. Daniel was given this special privilege because he was very precious to God. And this expression here is a commentary both on the grace of God and the godly character and life of Daniel. That God would refer to Daniel as precious. Next is verse 24. Now understand that there are only four verses left in this chapter. And you need to know that we can't even begin to get through this verse 24 this evening. Can't even start. Because this as you're going to find out next week, is really good stuff. But here's an intro for us, a chum, if you will, a little bait to see if you'll come back. Daniel 9.24, please. 70 weeks. Boy, there's that number 70 again. Popping up all over the place. There's even balloons out there with 70 on them. How'd that happen? Seventy weeks have been decreed, decreed for your people in your holy city for putting an end to transgression. Aha! An end to transgression. For making an end of sin. For forgiving iniquity. For bringing in everlasting justice. For setting the seal on vision and profit. And for anointing the especially holy place. You know what the especially holy place is? That's that little room in the back of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the presence of God hovered over that Ark of the Covenant. Wow. Think about it. All of the prophecies of this chapter is compacted into the last four verses. Mm -hmm. Verses 24 through 27 are one of, I believe, the most important pieces of prophecy in all of Tanakh, all of the Old Testament. This verse 24 presents the prophecy as a whole. Talks about the whole 70 weeks. Following verses explain and expand on this 24th verse. The 25th verse describes the first 69 weeks of the 70. The events between the 69th and 70 week are detailed in verse 26. And the final period of the 70th week is laid out in verse 27. Now, for this revelation to be properly understood, several significant matters concerning the prophecy must be noted. Number one, the prophecy concerns just the people of Israel and Jerusalem. I'm harping on this. God is harping on this. What occurs in the Gentile word is incidental as this is happening to Israel. The focus here is on Israel and Jerusalem. Therefore, the prophecy must be applied to only Israel and to the holy city. Number two, the amount of time covered by the prophecy is 490 years. 
The English word weeks, drive this home, the English word weeks, which is in a lot of translation, including Stearns that I'm using here, is misleading because the Hebrew word being translated here is actually the plural of the word seven. It's the plural of the word seven without specifically specifying whether it's days, weeks, months, or years. Somebody's theology has gotten pumped into this. So be careful. The phrase here, 70 weeks, is literally 70 sevens. There will be 70 sevens, or 70 times seven, which is 490. God has decreed 490 units of time. So then how much time is decreed with these 490 units? 490 days, 490 weeks, 490 months, 490 years. And the only system of interpretation that gives any literal meaning to this process is to regard these time units in prophetic years but of each year being 360 days, lunar years, lunar years. Israel and a lot of the other ancients of that time reckoned their time passage by the moon. Their calendar was a lunar calendar, and their years consisted of 360 days. So ever so often you had to throw in an extra month for correction. Our calendar today is a Gregorian calendar, which really is the Julian calendar in its final form. An interesting thing is that Julius Caesar got the basis for this out of Egypt, of all places. The Julian, or sun-based calendar, came into general use much, much after the period of time that Daniel is writing in here. So the count of these 70 times 7 years begins on the command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. And we're going to get into this in much depth when we get to verse 25 next week. We have to give particular attention to this precise foundation in prophecy. As the prophecy tells us that 77s are decreed. Seventy sevens are decreed. And the meaning of this is that the prophecy, now, what is seven? That's, that's talking about perfection. Seventy sevens. The meaning of that is the prophecy involves the comprehensive plan of God and the future events rendered certain. This is going to really happen. The overall plan being executed by God the prophecy determines that your people, Daniel, your holy city, will have restoration in a particular time frame. God has actually laid it out exactly how it's going to happen. At the time of this prophecy, Jerusalem lay in ruins, as did the temple of God, completely destroyed. But even at the time when both lay in ruins, they both still had a place set apart in the heart of God. Now, once it's understood to whom and what this prophecy relates, that it's the people of Israel and Judah and Jerusalem and ultimately to the rest of the tribes, then it can be understood. Six important purposes are established to be accomplished in the 490 years. And we're going to have to stop here for continuity's sake. It'll take all of our next lesson to work our way through these last four verses. And I don't want to get started on it and then have to break it off in the middle and catch up again. But I do want us to consider applying the prayer of Daniel, the prayer that Daniel used in his situation about the restoration of the people and of the restoration of Jerusalem. I think we should be applying that to our present time and present situation. If we'll just look at it honestly, just look at it honestly, the present situation in Jerusalem doesn't speak of restoration, it speaks of disintegration. Disintegration of a physical city, giving part of it to pagans, and a continued pagan presence on the Temple Mount of God, 
the very spot that we know Messiah is ultimately to come to, to reign as king of the whole world. So I believe, much as it was imperative for Daniel to be in prayer for this, it's imperative that we be in prayer for the restoration of the whole city to only God's people in the same manner as Daniel was praying. So that God's plan can be brought to completion. I don't think we need to get into giving God instructions on how he's supposed to do it. I think we simply need to get into doing it. And God very interestingly tells us something about this end of the age and that what we're supposed to be doing. Take this down, copy it, make it refrigerator art, read it every time you open the door. Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7. I have posted watchmen, shomrim, on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never fall silent, neither by day or by night. In other words, keep after him. You who call on Adonai, and listen to this, this is a challenge to us. You who call on Adonai, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest. Whoa! Thrash around in God's camp, man. Don't let him go to sleep. Don't let him have a nap. Don't give him any time off. Stay after him. You who call on Adonai, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest until he restores Jerusalem and makes it a praise on the earth. That's our instruction. See you next week.